Today I'm talking about towers. They are kind of one of the biggest things that you notice about a radio station. They're very tall. They are very prominent on the landscape and you can see them for miles and miles away. But the tower is either just a structure or it's the antenna itself. It kind of depends. With an FM station, it's the structure. With an AM station, it's the tower itself. So the anatomy of a tower. You have the tower itself, the structure, the steel part that goes up into the air. That's the obvious part. There are different styles, there are different ways that you can construct it, and there are actual companies out there that build towers. So that's not something that you will ever probably ever have to deal with. And maybe one of these days I can actually interview a tower company. That would be kind of cool. But let's continue talking about the tower. You also have different parts. Like I had mentioned earlier, there are guy lines and the guy lines are there to hold the tower in place. Now the tower itself is basically a stick standing straight up into the air. And that stick, when it feels any type of wind or any type of earth movement or whatever, or even just the structure itself warming and cooling or loading up with ice or any of that, needs to be supported. So there you have guy lines. And these guy lines will come off at certain points of the structure to hold it in place, to keep that tower from twisting or from bending or from collapsing. It has happened. A guy line fails and tower goes down. Never, never a good thing. But the guy lines are there to support it, to basically hold that tower in place. And it provides uh, stress, not stress is not the right word, but tension to hold that, that stick in the air at the right angle that it needs to be, which is straight up and down, and to keep it from moving. Granted, there's gonna be some movement just because nothing's perfect, but this, these guy lines keep it from moving. And these guy lines come down to uh, guy line bases, and these things go down into the ground for a good amount of distance. Because there's a lot of, of, of stress that happens when a tower is loaded with ice or when a tower is uh, hit by wind. Not sure if you can hear it, but that noise is the wind passing through the towers. The towers are singing. So you want to make sure that those guy lines don't come out of the ground. I was at a station in Bakersfield where we had guy lines that were in very soft dirt. And I think they buried them pretty well, the best that they could. But you could start to see behind the guy anchor, that's the bottom part of the guy lines, the anchor started to pull. And you can see the little bit of a crater that was being formed. Again, it happens. So you need to have a company come out and rebury those and re-strengthen them and even tension those guy lines every so often because the steel will start to stretch, it'll sag, and it won't hold the tower in the right position. There's a bunch of birds on the tower and on the guy wires. And they're making all kinds of noise. The second most obvious thing about a radio station tower is the tower markings, whether it be paint, whether it be lights. Those are the two main ways of marking a tower. The tower that's behind me has lights on full time. Tower marking is regulated by the FAA. Now the FAA doesn't want pilots running into obstacles and obstructions. And a 800, 900,000 foot tower is definitely an obstruction. The FAA regulates tower marking, lights, paint, and that is all set forth in the FAA advisory circular AC 70 slant 7460-1 Lima. It talks about tower light, tower paint, and what towers need to be painted and lighted. And it talks about different other types of structures too. 
water towers, water tanks, large buildings that are near airports. There are all different types of obstructions that need to be marked. And this circular talks about which ones need to be marked and how they need to be marked. So let's talk about tower painting real quick. The iconic red and white paint that you'll see on a, on a structure, it's required by the FAA and the FCC technically. Now there are ways that you can go about doing it. The tower behind me is not painted. They can use lights, daytime lights, instead of painting. And these are white strobes that, that happen. And we'll talk about lights here in a minute. But the, the paint is there so pilots don't fly into towers. It makes them very obvious and stand out from the background, from the landscape. So it's that aviation orange and it's a white and they're alternating bands and it's the each band is about one seventh of the tower structure there have been some incidents where aircraft have struck towers uh the one that i heard about relatively recently was in los angeles back in gosh 2004 I believe it was. Uh, KFI in Los Angeles, actually La Mirada, is near the Fullerton Airport. And it was unfortunate. It was a Sunday morning and this aircraft hit a tower and the pilot and the passenger were killed. But it also caused the old tower that was there, their 800 foot AM tower to collapse on itself. And it pretty much just came straight down. Now, the new tower, now that tower, that old tower was painted. It was lit at night. It was marked on the, tr on the charts, the aeronautical charts. So it is known it, it, and it predates the airport that was built. So it's been known, but accidents do happen. So we want to reduce the amount of accidents and that's why we have to paint and light the towers. You're probably familiar with the red lights that you see on the towers, like the ones over my shoulder here. Well, those are part of the required tower markings that the FAA has, says you need to have if you have a tower. These lights are there for pilots to see the towers at night. So, like medical helicopters, police helicopters, or even just flights that happen at night, you want to know and you want to see where the towers are. So there's a couple of systems at work. And uh, you generally have your aviation red obstruction lights, and these are your typical red lights that you see, like these over here over my shoulder, that you have the steady burning ones and you have the flashing ones that happen at the top of the tower. These have typically been incandescent lights for the majority of the history of tower lighting. And now with LED technology, it's become a lot cheaper to operate these lights. You also have medium intensity obstruction lights, and uh, these are gonna flash during the daytime and then kinda get dimmer for the nighttime automatically. And then you also have your high intensity white obstruction lights. And these are the ones you definitely can see during the daytime. They are bright white flashings. Those are the ones you've seen earlier in this video on that tower. And as they also turn their intensity down so that way you don't blind pilots or people who live in areas nearby. And it's all based on what was specified when the tower was built. And then again, then again, there's oddballs. Uh, there's some historic towers that have something very, very different for tower lighting. Now that I'm inside where it's a little bit warmer, let's talk about maintaining your tower lights, uh, monitoring your tower lights. Uh, tower climbers, tower safety, things like that. So monitoring your tower lights. There are systems that do this. There are systems that monitor the amount of current that is being used by the lights when they turn on. And when those lights turn on, it pulls a certain amount of current. And when the lights turn off, it stops pulling that current. So it can monitor how fast the lights are blinking. It can monitor how long the lights are blinking and there's a lot of alarming that you can can do with it and to know how your lighting system is working that's with your standard typical aviation red obstruction lights which are your you know your red ones 
And really, if those are the incandescent ones, once you start getting into the world of LED lights, then it's a little bit different because the power draw is a lot less. And so it's harder to monitor for these older systems if your lights are on and if they're working properly. There are newer systems that will monitor those and they have different ways of doing it, but you need to have some method of monitoring your tower lights because you need to know when those lights go off and the fact that they do turn on. The FCC does require that you monitor your tower lights at least once every 24 hours, whether that be visually or by equipment, by remote control equipment. So having a remote control is very nice. I can tie right into your remote control system and automatically log it every day and notify you if it doesn't turn on or if they turn off or if there's any type of failure. If your lights do turn off or they don't turn on when they're supposed to, then you need to call the FAA's notice to airmen line. And it's a phone number that you call and you basically get a notice to airmen or NOTAM issued. And a NOTAM is basically a notification to pilots that tells them, hey, the tower, the, the lights, the obstruction lights on this obstruction are off. Whether it be a tower, whether it be a water tank, whether it be a building or whatever, they are expecting lights to be on and this notice basically tells them, hey, the lights are not working. So it's important. You call them up, you give them your name, who you are, your antenna site registration, an ASR number, That's there's a unique one for every tower obstruction. They will give you a NOTAM number. You write that down, you get their initials, and they will basically say, thanks, have a good day. It's good for 15 days. If for some reason you need to go beyond 15 days, you need to call them back and say, hey, I need to extend it. My equipment is still not working. And they'll say, no problem. It's extended. If you get it resolved, you need to call them back and let them know, hey, this has been resolved and you can cancel that NOTAM. Now, I did have a time when I did make a call and I didn't know that it A, expires and B, that you need to uh, cancel it. I got a phone call from the FCC saying, hey, you have this NOTAM open still. Uh, is this still going? And I didn't realize that I needed to cancel it. So I said, oh yes, my bad, I did not cancel it. I did not know. And they're like, no problem, give them a call and cancel it. So that was a pretty no biggie there, fortunately. But I'm letting you know, you need to cancel it when you get it fixed. Having that as part of your record, as part of your station log, just make it, make a notation of it, what the NOTAM number is, your, the initials of the person who took the call, and why they were off. Let's touch on safety for just a moment. Now, if you are not sure if it's an AM or an FM antenna, don't touch it. In fact, you should not even be past the fences where the signs, the warning signs are if you don't know what you're doing. If you don't know the difference between an AM and FM tower, you should not be behind that fence, period. Now, an AM tower, we'll have the, the stick, the antenna, sitting on, on top of a ceramic cylinder, kind of like this, except it's usually darker brown. But anyways, it's, the antenna is sitting on top of just that, that ceramic cylinder. Now, that ceramic cylinder is actually an insulator and that insulates the antenna from ground. Because the tower is the antenna, the currents are going to be insanely dangerous. You do not want to be touching that tower because then you become the path to ground. You will get electrocuted and that will be a very bad day for you. So don't do that. If you need to touch the tower for whatever reason, make sure the transmitter is off. Make sure you safety the transmitter, whether that be opening the circuit breaker or otherwise disabling any way for a remote control, someone at the studio to turn on the transmitter or anybody else working at the site to turn on the transmitter. You don't want that thing being turned on while you're out there working at the tower. Second thing is when you're working on the tower, not only is it a good transmitting antenna, it's also a very good receiving antenna. Now by that, I mean, it will receive other stations that are nearby and maybe not so nearby. 
and you'll still get all those electrical currents. And when you touch that tower, you're gonna get zapped, electrocuted. You might, it might even be fatal. It really depends, but there's ways to make sure a tower is safe. You can get standard automotive jumper cables and connect one side to the tower to bare metal on the tower and the other side to ground, but not like the ground ground, but uh, there's usually a couple of little balls that are sitting next to each other near the base of the tower. And these balls are there for lightning protection. They're basically a, a spark gap. Usually there's, there's bare metal on those, so you can clamp to one, clamp to the other. But that's your good point for grounding your antenna. Always ground your antenna when you work on it. It's very important for an AM station. Uh, if you're an FM station, it, the tower's probably sitting on metal or concrete base, and you know it's safe to touch for the most part. Now, I probably should have to say this, but I will. Under no circumstances is there any reason for you to climb the tower. Period. End of story. Full stop. Do not do it. You are not a tower climber. There is nothing that is important enough for you to risk your life to climb a tower. There is nothing important enough. Being off the air doesn't matter. Don't do it. It is not worth your life. Uh, too many times have people climbed towers thinking, oh, well, they know what they do. I, I'm, I can hang on pretty good. And they fall. And even a fall from 10, 15 feet can be fatal. Imagine falling from higher than that. There are sensitive things on the tower that you could step on, grab, break, squish, that you would basically be doing damage and you wouldn't even realize it. So again, don't climb the tower. There is no reason for you to climb any towers. Call a tower company. I've got three here that I've worked with that I have great respect for. Complus, Beckman Tower, and Vic Solberg. Those three, I have worked with all three of them and I have been very happy with what the service that they have provided. So don't, don't climb the tower. Leave it to the professionals. They have the training, they have the equipment, and they have the experience, and they have the insurance. So don't climb the towers. Okay, I'm getting off my, my PSA soapbox here on being safe. Thank you for watching today. I appreciate you being here. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Otherwise, um, well, if you're not subscribed, subscribe. Uh, leave a comment or question down below. I try to answer those as best I can. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep learning.